as you can tell, we have a pretty social scene here at the AA. So you guys are going to make a lot of friends during this lecture. Um, we're really thankful for a lot of people that have basically joined us over the last two days. Uh, my name is Theodor Sparopoulos. I have the pleasure of directing uh, the DRL uh, with a very good group of staff and students who are always coming uh, every year and making this presentation and this particular introduction always more and more difficult for me. Um, we've seen two days full of work uh, filled with optimism, unapologetically believing that design actually has the capacity to make a meaningful difference. And the scope of those things could be from the scale of a material, an environment, a city, a building, basically anything that could be considered design basically has a space in this place to be experimented, interrogated, and explored. We invite a lot of critics to help us basically shape and to basically open up in a much more conversational manner the nature of what design research is as a kind of platform to basically speak to some of the challenges of the contemporary and how we basically make the possibilities for a meaningful difference in a kind of context which is always changing and architecture seems always in some form of crisis. And through the conversations, I think oh, over a quarter of a century now, when I say that, it's almost ridiculous and makes me feel a lot older, like in dog years, um, standing behind here. But we always ask somebody to join us uh, to give a keynote lecture. And the keynote lecture uh, for us is really people that obviously we have a great deal of respect and admiration, but we also feel can contribute, I think, to a different kind of journey in terms of the nature of practice. A lot of the engagements that we engage here, particularly at the AA, uh, is not really an academic exercise. It's more about the belief system that coming together, collectively working on problems, can really not only challenge us, but help us somehow create a world uh, to take the title of Thomas's uh, new book can be more humanized. Uh, I've known Thomas's work for a long time, uh, really discovered it when I uh, found myself uh, in very close proximity to the Rolling Bridge, which was a small kinetic uh, project, very detail-oriented, very design-oriented, and really something that, at the smallest scale, can kind of open up a certain degree of curiosity, challenge the norms and the kind of orthodoxy, but then also just have a state of wonder. Um, with respect to this lecture, and I had the privilege of listening to Thomas talk about his book and his practice recently. Uh, the book is being sold in the back if anybody's interested to have a copy. Thomas has very kindly offered to sign them afterwards. And uh, the nature of the format for today is that Thomas will, will present a talk, we'll have a short conversation, and then open it up for a conversation with yourselves. Uh, so I know that a lot of people have been anticipating this lecture, and it's a really beautiful thing to see this space uh, really filled with so many people here, uh, believing, I believe, that architecture and urbanism uh, is a very important thing to spend the Friday night uh, discussing, <laughs> sharing, and uh, problematizing. So I, I want to thank Thomas for accepting my invitation. I want to thank Ankel for helping support that with insider kind of office <laughs> conversations, and Jess and Matt and everybody who's been in communication with me, this came together quickly. And this is a testimony mostly to Thomas's generosity to come and have this conversation with us today. So uh, with that, I don't think I need to tell you who Thomas Heatherwick is. Uh, I'm going to let him do that through the work that the office is doing. So. Okay. Thank you, Theo. Um, I'm, I'm really amazed that you're all here on Friday night. And when I, I kind of got a glimpse of the kind of, not mauling, but the kind of uh, creative ordeal you've been going through for two days, and the intensity, I was genuinely amazed that, well, I suppose if you fall asleep, it's OK. Um, <laughs> um, but I, I am really honored to have been asked to come and speak here. 
and uh, it's many of my studio team over the years have have come here and uh, I think I'd formed in my mind the the sort of image of drawings endless drawings endless drawings and just now it was I was walking around through all the floors I didn't see any drawings I just saw the most amazing objects everywhere everywhere it was really incredible so um, I, I in a way I, I, rem I hope that I can sh talk about a few things uh, that are sort of maybe about a, the bridge from those models to how do you make things really happen in the real world because you can feel in this bubble when you're in, in an academic setting and I suppose my passion is how you make real things happen for people uh, and not just for each other and um, so I'm going to begin with talking a little bit about, I had once was invited to this dinner with somebody uh, who was related to something we were working on. And I was used to, whenever you go out to things, people just talk. And he stopped everybody, got us at the table and just said, go round the table, what's on your mind? What's on your mind? And I just felt, huh? it felt sort of a bit in intense to, and pr private to sort of say what's on my mind. But it was, in a way, one of the most amazing conversations. And I thought I'd just start with, in a way, what's been on, on my mind uh, uh, and has come out from various different um, bits of, of trying to focus and think over the last few years that, that was uh, the ingredients, really, that are at uh, the base of the, the piece of book thinking. And there was this just lovely uh, expression that a property developer called Jim Rouse in the US had when he was talking about making a new settlement uh, with, I think it was 115,000 acres of land in Maryland. And he created Columbia. And it, this was... It began, the project really sort of kicked off properly in 1967. And he was not happy as a commercial developer with the way that towns were developing. And he felt that with the Jim Crow laws and the racial segregation that was happening, how could you make somewhere that was more equitable for, uh, for all, everyone who lived there and with less of the huge imbalances and just he said, look, I, I believe that we can be profitable as well as making somewhere that is really good for people. And how can a city be a gardens for growing people? And, uh, and I, it felt that it's so easy in our industry to be focused on us and our work and what I do and to, f in a way, forget that our job is actually we're in public service. So we're, in a sense, we're public servants and how to really keep that, that in mind. And I, I know that there's uh, incredible thinking in when you're working out the program of buildings and working out the, how you get the daylight in all the different aspects in buildings. But typically, it's only a very privileged few people who will go into a brand spanking new building. And... I've felt that we have tended to neglect the fact that a thousand times more people will never go inside your amazing building, but it will be part of the backdrop of their lives. And in a way, there's been a bit of a trend against outsides of buildings, you know, as if that's shallow and that that's just facadism and this is just stupid icon making and this is vanity. But if you actually think about what, who do you want to be generous to, um, it, it, we, are, we are struggling in public life now when you know that you can stay at home and you can eat anything you want without leaving your home. You can probably get a PhD from lying in your bed at home. Why go out? Uh, and it's because that's where you meet people. And we, people talk about the lonely century. And there's, someone's written this book, and that just echoes in my head as this thing. So actually, if we say, well, buildings 
forget about the building, think of them as the backdrop to the public rooms of our lives, I, I feel we have not cared enough about the outsides of buildings. And uh, so uh, the interesting thing is to try and I, to put yourself in the, f in the shoes of other people. And a, a lot of the time we are always putting ourselves in the shoes of ourselves or other people like ourselves. But to use the incredible powers of imagination that are in this room, but not just to imagine something great, but to imagine how someone else would feel about what you do who doesn't come to any lecture. And I certainly experienced when I was studying things where something wouldn't touch you, and then you'd go to the lecture, and maybe this is going to happen tonight, and then you go, oh, wow, that's amazing, at the end of the lecture. But that means those thousand times, all those people, the thousand times more people who aren't invested in that story are working there, living there, how do we really think about those people who aren't in our, shoe, in our shoes? And it feels like using our imaginations, that's where you really need your imagination. Um, because I assume, selfishly, we actually want to do things that engage other people and give joy and make the world around us maybe mean something to the people who come into contact with them. And I suppose we've just... I, I just feel we don't call out what's happened over the last century in terms of... And this isn't a, a, a modernism bashing session. This is, this is a look what happened session. Look what ha the hell happened. Who would care if that got knocked down? And would you want to go on a date outside those buildings? And would the person who designed these actually want to live and, and it, it just feels like we've, we've got to call out. We've had a crisis in this last century. A weird thing happened. And so, and it's just maybe a funny word to use. And we were wrecking our brains, wrecking our brains with the, my collaborators and friends of the studio. And it, we ended up with actually one word. And it's really a rubbish word in a sense. It's a really disappointing word. It's a bit... Uh, like, huh? you don't know a whole book about that word. But the word's boring. And it's not the word beauty and things like that, which are very charged. And so I, I suppose I'm really interested in not in like, how do we do something that's so gorgeously, amazingly beautiful? It's like, how do we not do total rubbish? How, how is that that this thing happens? So... Actually, when we say, w -w 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 -w, what do you mean by boring? We, it's like, okay, let's, let's look at that. And suddenly you start getting the things that, in my experience, when you start talking across to lots of people, the ingredients that tend to be there in things that people say sterile, boring, or characterless, are... Flatness, plainness, straightness, shininess, monotony, anonymousness, seriousness. It's amazing how incredibly serious. I was just um, kind of psyching myself up to have to speak tonight. And so I watched BBC iPlayer, this program about these, um, uh, their, um, God, what was their name? They, they did the, all the Pink Floyd covers. And they were just talking about how did we do something that is that engages people and is interesting <laughs> so basic uh, and yet the word interesting is a word that's quite devalued it's what you say when you don't really like something but you want to sound like you're being positive <laughs> but actually it's a quite important word um, and on their own something that is shiny can be amazing by itself that it's, um, Depending what type of building, so many building types, it's right that it should be anonymous, or right that it should be plain, or straightness is actually amazing. But in a way, I think this is a little bit like we're talking about um, if you are uh, snorting cocaine, injecting heroin, drinking too much vodka, um, and uh, you, know, you add them together, and it starts to be when you, we have a problem. Um, 
So the typical thing is that someone who appears to say what I appear to have just said is that I appear to be saying, oh, it was so much better in the old days, let's build, we need to copy the, the past. And I don't believe that. And I think that there's, there's, there are people who want to portray it as this really over-simple argument. It's like you either like modern stuff, and that might be plain, straight, serious, all of those things. Or you just want to copy the past. And the public, the public, I, I, I really feel we've underrated the public. And too much narrative is as if the public are ignorant. And I think that's a dangerous, dangerous way to think. Because the public are experts on buildings. I've never met someone who wasn't, hasn't lived their entire life in buildings. They may not be articulate, but my experience is everyone is smart and there are multiple intelligences. And we utterly disrespect people if we think that they are not smart. And what's interesting is when you actually look at Britain's top 10 most loved buildings, two of them, modern, public don't just want old things. And when we look and from the world point of view, and we look at take it Google searches, seven of the top ten are within the last century. So I don't believe that we can portray the public as, oh, they just want to go back to the past, they don't, don't understand modern, they're not interested in that. It's not true. They just don't like boring things. And that's understandable. Um, and it's, it's just... Interesting that the ways we made buildings were more conducive in the past. The, way, the materials, they kind of forced it. And this pre-industrial revolution, it was kind of, maybe you could argue, it was kind of hard to make things that didn't have detail and, um, and craftsmanship and, and all these di various different things uh, built into them. Whether it was, so this is not uh, an argument for expensive things. I mean, even... A, a fisherman's hut tended to have visual complexity and, and uh, interest. Uh, it didn't have to be a palace. There was visual, I would argue, necessary visual complexity at all different types and scales. 2,000 years ago, 1,000 years ago, 500 years ago, 150 years ago, uh, something happened and things started to change. But the thing that's, I think, important to talk about is the, the word boring sounds like it's a, a taste conversation. It's like, well, no, but it's... I, I personally like calm, I like monotony. and think We all can like rhythms and repetitions, all of those things. But there is a certain bit which tips to harmful boring. And, uh, and that the interesting thing is that there's this... Massive, we're in this massive industry, which I think is in the top three industries on the planet. And it's astonishing how unmeasured it is. And how we, it's very cerebral and has been for a, a very long time. But we, we haven't necessarily actually really analysed the neuroscience side of things to really look what do people actually feel and think? And it's, there are, given this massive industry, given the immense spending on it, it's astonishing how it's the science of actually understand, uh, understanding people's responses, of being in other people's shoes, is still an astonishingly uh, early phase. But there are a few neuroscientists who are starting to really look into this. One of them is Colin Ellard, in um, Canada who uh, has done various different studies and is looking across all, many sides, particularly in the world of architecture. But I think that we have um, simplified the, an understanding of public response to place by thinking that um, it's a question of taste and that's a learned thing. But what's interesting now in the tools that we have uh, and many people have smartwatches and uh, the, the Fitbits and some of the things that are sensing your body's response to, uh, from a health point of view, it's now possible to see 
how people's bodies are reacting, not what their mind is, uh, is saying, what they got taught or anything like that, but actually how they feel. And what Colin Ellard was, was finding, so this is the Whole Earth, um, Whole Foods building in New York, um, and this is one of the studies he did, um, which is plain, flat, shiny, serious, um, all, of, all of those, uh, most of those things, new, new building that got built in, I think, the last 15 years. Um, and then took, so he took a group to various different settings, but these two seemed uh, a good way to show people's bodies started to spike the cortisol. And in effect, their bodies were going into stress when they were in proximity to the building at the top. Um, and uh, the opposite in the more com visually complex environment and in the bottom thing. And it just seemed, who's properly, like, why, why isn't that a fascinating thing for us to start working with and from and around and deepening that, the science of response of our bodies? Um, and so it seemed that there is a necessary visual complexity that is our, that our bodies need. And what, in effect, when, when you take away that visual comp complexity, I think there was the idea that complexity is somehow a luxury. And I think what we've learned is our minds, and it's not time to kind of go into it now, but you know, things like biophilia is you are, it's the complexity, if you're looking out at a forest, that actually calms you. And that take away that complexity and actually your, your body, nothing to do with what your head is saying, is, is, is responding with a stress response. And I assume most people in this room would actually like people to like what you do. So what, what, where do we get, how, suddenly we don't need to use words like decoration. You suddenly go, well, visual complexity, the body needs that. What, so how do we study that? But then the other side of this is, because it, obviously it sounds like, we're in a time of crisis, there's a health crisis, wealth inequality crisis, Ukraine crisis, Russia nuclear, there's all these crises. And you, you then sort of think, are you just talking about niceness? Is this a, a niceness conversation? And I think it's really important to sort of put it in context that I don't think this is a niceness conversation. I think this, the, actually, this relates to particularly the environment crisis. Because the problem when people don't care is that buildings get demolished because they don't seem to be worth keeping. And so in China, the average age of a commercial building is 34. So if I was a commercial building, I would have been killed 20 years ago. Um, maybe that's a good thing. But the, uh, the point is, that uh, in the US, they demolish a billion square foot of buildings every year. That's the equivalent of half of Washington, DC. In the UK, we, we demolish 50,000 buildings a year. Um, and the average age in the UK is 40 years for a commercial building. And so, but the thing is, you can say your building's great that you've designed, but it won't be you who decides who keeps it up. It's going to be someone who's just walked past outside's granddaughter. How are they, who hasn't come to your lecture? And they're going to say, mm, maybe we could repair it or adjust it or adapt it or extend it. And so, how, again, in putting yourself in the shoes of others, what, what would make somebody value something enough? And, but why does that matter? Because, again, it sounds like, oh, yeah, everyone's talking about the environmental crisis. Well, it's, it's construction's dirty secret. Well, it's the dirty, one of the biggest dirty secrets, really, in the, in, in when we talk about environmentalism, in that we talk about the aviation industry, and the aviation industry is responsible for 2.1% of greenhouse gases. The construction industry is responsible for five times that. And the, the industry, of the whole of construction and running buildings, is 16 times that. And, and so it's, but we don't talk about that. We do talk about, oh, should I go on holiday? Should we fly there? No, well, let's have a staycation or whatever those, those things are. But if we look here 
at the amount of energy it takes to make a Big Mac. Um, and that's four kilos of carbon. And then it's the energy taken to, to get a space rocket into space, which is 250 tonnes. The energy taken to build a medium-sized tower. So one of uh, the, uh, the cheese grater, which I like, but to, to do that, uh, at the size of the book, it's an extra 10 metres further than the double-page spread, the amount of carbon. So that's 23 million Big Macs to make that building. And so if you were to follow the average age of a commercial building being 40 years, that's terrible if you make something that that person who walked past granddaughter um, doesn't fight to keep to save or protect or enhance or extend. And it doesn't feel we're talking about that enough. But, and obviously, the, the situation we're in has come around for very good reason. We had an industrial revolution, and we had mass urbanization, and we had the huge wealth inequality and squalor and slums. Um, but it's important to remember slums, if you take, I mean, some of the most loved buildings in London, in Notting Hill, were classed as slums because there were eight families in a building. When there's one family in a building, it's a luxury villa now. And so it, it wasn't necessarily always just the buildings, but that led, there was also this um, a fad, really, that washed through at the excitement of learning about the subconscious from Freud and uh, all the different huge breakthroughs that were happening in the 20th century. And that swept into the arts. And so in the world of arts, the figurative sculpture was out and the idea that you could express more about the subconscious in, a, in that sculptural representation radically transformed. In painting, you could radically transform how we thought about portraiture, dance, poetry. You know, it washed through, even got it to hairdressing with um, Vidal Sassoon. But the big difference with buildings is that a dance performance can challenge you intellectually and be amazing, but you can then also walk out. And uh, the, a painting on somebody's wall, you can walk out of the gallery or you don't have to buy it or the sculpture. But when it came, comes to buildings, you can't walk away. They're the backdrop of everyone's lives. So there's a different responsibility in that that maybe does mean you need to put yourself in other people's shoes. And so these three, this, the unholy trinity, these three statements, very much, you know, century old, but they're, they're kind of still in my head. I st you still kind of go, does form the whole of function? And you, you, it, it's kind of deep in us. And, um, and the ornament is crime. And, you know, even though Louis Sullivan did some of the most richly decorated buildings, he still left us with form follows function, kind of stuck in there. And, uh, you know, for years with my studio's work, I've had people sort of saying, you know, you do, you know, your stuff and, you know, I do functional stuff. And you sort of think, actually, our passion is function, but we believe that emotion is a function. And if you're not actually working with emotion, then maybe you're not actually being functional. And I would argue those things that maybe I showed earlier that say they're functional aren't necessarily. Um, but the, the challenge was that this was, it was cheaper. This amazing mindset that kicked in was also cheaper to build. And so it was a kind of gift that has kept on giving and will keep on giving. And, and I'm fascinated with having seen all the amazing models that you're doing upstairs. Our challenge is how do we work with a lot of these mindsets and this economic challenge that now, if you're not the cheapest possible box, people say you're being expensive. And yet, real expensive is environmental damage potentially at mass scale of the littering of buildings that 
are, are not cared enough, so they get sort of chucked away. So in a way, I think we talk about fast fashion, but we've had uh, as being kind of low quality, trashy clothes, but in a way, we've had fast architecture, trashy, trashy buildings that somehow we talked ourselves into thinking they were right and we were sophisticated and the public didn't understand when they repeatedly didn't engage. Um, but I suppose the change can happen at different times and in school lunches. School lunches were famously terrible when I was little um, and nutritionally could be pretty terrible. That, and I don't know if you had turkey Twizzlers. I don't know, if maybe people from Asia would never have had a turkey Twizzler. But the nutritional value is virtually zero of what got given to children. And in effect, if we think about what our minds need, what our bodies need, we've had very low nutritional value. And so what an interesting time to think about what is actually going to nourish other people and not just us in our crits with each other, talking to each other. Um, and we've had the idea of the green premium. In, in industry, you do now, there's, there's no major corporation who can sign a lease for workspaces without the board all looking at each other and asking whether this environmentally, this is a good pr property to be in because they're answerable to shareholders, shareholders are ethically responsible. And so the idea of a green premium, because it costs a little bit more to make buildings that are, have these sustainability credentials. But I would argue that it isn't sustainable until it also has, is emotionally sustainable and, and has meaning and engagement not just for the people inside. So much is about the insides of buildings, and I've spoken to many people, and they go, we do post-occupancy surveys with our buildings. You go, yeah, but you're surveying the people who are inside. You're not surveying someone who will never come in your building the, and actually taking on board what their thoughts are. And by the way, this, I'm not advocating mass consultation. Everything is decided by focus groups. I'm not. I mean, we, I, I'm advocating that you could be by yourself in a room like a selfish designer bastard designing, but thinking of how other people will feel and, and really trying to learn uh, through the work you do so that you can make decisions that are based on giving, buildings that end up as givers rather than takers. So the argument is really that we don't have a real premium until we have a human premium. And that probably is a percent or two more. It doesn't have to be much more than that. Then we actually will be making sustainable buildings. So in our own work, in the way that we've been thinking, in effect, it was interesting to try and sort of frame how we've been thinking about things. Um, and in a way, we're proposing a humanized rule, really. And I mean, any way you want to frame something to yourself but that a building should be able to hold your attention for the time it takes to pass by it. That doesn't mean walk past going, <gasps> oh! but just to, for your eyes to be able to connect. Because there's, the buildings that I think we respond best to, have an, there's a necessary amount of visual complexity that just allows your eye to, to move across. And now that it's possible with the headsets to do retina tracking, you can see the buildings that people just kind of register things on. And, and that's only the bottom two floors, bottom first floor. This isn't about making everything become Sydney Opera Houses and Gherkins, but where is your emotion? It's probably at the bottom of that building. And so how, how, does, how do people feel when they're with what you make? And how could they feel? And are you interested in those feelings? And can we start saying to ourselves very clearly that emotion is a function? Because that, that no one's coming to your lecture. No, I mean, in the big scheme of things, kind of no one's coming to my lecture either. It's, they're, they're there. Can you begin a journey of engagement? And that doesn't mean dumb gesture. 
where everything just got them immediately. But it's a problem when something doesn't even engage someone at all and they'd have to come to a lecture to even begin to care. Um, and can we make, it's a provocation obviously, but how do you make the buildings that might stay being around? I mean, who's going to knock this building down? Who's going to actually knock it down? You're probably going to keep adapting. It's amazing how this has been adapted and adjusted. You know, if you were... If you were historic England, you'd say, what have you done to this building? You've ruined it. But it was worth it. Um, so you, with the book, you get a free bit you can cut out. Um, but the, and you can stick it on your wall or on your underpants or whatever. But the bit at the bottom, in a way, was, is just a mindset that uh, motivated me when I was starting the studio, really, which was about these three distances which is the, the distance of your project and the city and how, how people perceive it, it peripheral vision, what, how does something sit alongside everything that it's with. But then once you start getting to the street, street distance, so, that, so the first distance is maybe 100 metres, 150 metres, you might be on a train, you might be on a coach, you might be walking past, just getting glimpses across different places, but street is when you're starting to be maybe 30 metres, 20 metres. Maybe you can't see the top of a building, but you're starting to think about how someone feels there. But noticing you're, you're not really... Who cares what the top is? You're feeling... Where you're feeling is more the, those bottom two floors. But then there's the door distance. And the door distance, I would argue, is where the most emotion is. And... Are there, what we're finding is that in planning policy, and we're speaking to different planning authorities around the world, and planning authorities tend to have policies for city distance. They tend to have policies for street distance, but they tend to have no policy at door distance. And what I mean by that is you go to the fanciest, I'm not going to name them, but fancy amazing buildings, go and stand this far away from them, and they probably... City distance, awesome. Street distance, great. Door distance, another glass door. Same handle, identical hinge. It's like, what a missed opportunity. It's so cheap to do things at that scale. And when you, you know that diagram at the beginning with the thousands of people, they aren't in helicopters. They're on the ground. They're just cycling, walking. So for it, the, that's the place where you can really connect with people. And, and so um, when, you know, I'm just grabbing a project because this isn't about, I mean, this, it's hard for me to talk about because in a way, you know, when people say what's on your mind, I hope this is, this is the year that my studio has been going for 30 years. And I never thought we'd get the chance to do the projects we're doing. I never thought I'd be standing here in front of all of you. But this, in a sense, is a direction that we with our team are going in ourselves. But I'm not uh, talking about the obvious um, opera houses and art museums, because surprise, surprise, people always go, opera house, it better be cultural, let's make it artistic, let's do a composition. Actually, if we really think about culture, I believe culture is like the recycling center where everyone's going along. It's the, old, it's the care home. It's the Young Offenders Institute. It's, and so that, that journey is a journey we would like to go on, on with more with our own work. But so this is a social housing project, project in Finchley. I just went past the other day. It's by Peter Barber. Um, and so if we talk about those distances, at city distance, it's, a, it's arresting. It catches your eye. It sort of, sort of reminds you of castles, but there's nothing, it's kind of nothing like a castle. Um, and then... As you get up to door distance, there's this... It's, so this is social housing, very low budget. And then when you're there, in the centre, there's this curving street. And there's all the plastic electricity things. But they're arranged. So you even enjoy all these funny plastic um, meter covers as a rhythm as they move round. And um, the, so you, it feels good at street distance. But then when you get to door distance, you know, total, you, you know, mindset would be easily, it's, low, it's social housing, there's no budget, how, but they've forced through 
also putting in quirks and details. So there's patches of brick just pushed in, reversed, turned round, sort of reminiscent of the window tax blocking in of windows. The stairs up to the, the raised flats aren't just dead straight. They've got a little nook where if you're a child, you'd kind of hide there, ready to kind of kick your mum as she goes past, <laughs> something like that. But door distance, they cared. That doesn't cost much. But actually, it's one of uh, arguably the thing that c you connects with. So um, that's kind of what's on our minds in the, and conversations in the studio. So I've, I've, I thought I'd also bring uh, seven projects and show you as well. So uh, the first thing I'm going to show is the most recent thing that we, we've been completing. It's in Tokyo. And so the seven different sides of sort of the garden around us of the world uh, that we're looking at. Um, and so the first one is thinking about togetherness. There's a site in the center of Tokyo. It's very close to the Tokyo Tower. And it took them 27 years to get uh, all the people who lived on this site to agree. So they were all part of the project, everyone who owned all of these bu buildings on the site. And in fact, there's one of them is 99 and has just moved into one of our apartments in it. But there used to be the main post office on the left of Tokyo. And so they all agreed to be part of making a new district. And we were commissioned to do this. And in the middle is a one tower by Pelly Clark Pelly, very simple tower. Uh, and in effect, that one tower facilitated uh, the district that then has um, one subway station at one end, another at the other, and it's got about a 18 meter height difference from one end to the other. Um, and so what was interesting to us was trying to think, how can we make a, a varied district, but also make somewhere that has an idea? And we, it seems our challenge of our time is how you make places that um, can connect with people. And so we were very interested in whether we could integrate nature and right in the center of the city, when you analyze Tokyo, there's hardly any green in the city. It's very, very little. And so it felt we must bring green in here. But we also needed to make school, we needed to make workspace, uh, a, the, a new temple was gonna be built and uh, robing rooms and uh, performance spaces and galleries and team labs. I don't know if you know team labs, their main headquarters were gonna, was going to move here. Uh, and so we looked, could we find a language that could be uh, an overarching language, but that might also make a, uh, some variety in it as well. And we were interested in pergola structures where you get nature growing through. Uh, and so we wondered whether we could three-dimensionalize a pergola structure and then supersize that so that we, it can then become the, the buildings uh, and at different scales. Uh, and sorry, these are uh, sort of slightly cheesy um, renders from five years ago. Uh, but looking at could, uh, could you, what extremes could you pull that to, uh, but to make something with, uh, which could be chopped in a way, it's like chopping up um, fabric at different scales um, across the site. It was a funny, squeezed, choked bit of site. Um, and there's a main temple there on the left. There's another shrine. And Tokyo is interesting because it doesn't just have business district with where all the towers are. When you look at Tokyo, there's low, 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 tower, low, 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 tower, low, low. So it mixes scales very, very well. And I actually think that's the right way for cities rather than just glooming in streets with lots of medium tall things in one go. But this meant that we could then push through these different uh, pavilions into that uh, geometry that could have a slight different language. Um, and then we could make this landscape be something that is explorable and something you can rise up and at the heart make a, a new main piece of park um, which all these pieces go onto, but then also the invitations to pull you into the, la the underworld that stitches through because of the level difference and sort of pops out. So in, uh, outdoors and indoors blurs with all the different levels. Um, and then uh, once it pulls you through, make, uh, make main spaces that can pull people together. 
Um, so the, the heart of it really was if we jump, so that was that city distance, but we knew it would have no meaning unless we could get door distance. And so we, the seismic things in uh, Japan, the pressures are massive, so you, have, you end up with chunky structures. So we knew we had to love chunky. And so it's like, how do, how do you make that um, have emotional resonance somehow? Sounds really pretentious, but the, um, we, we were looking at whether we could make the reinforced, um, glass reinforced uh, concrete that would be the cladding over the steel structures, because there's no option, you had to use steel, how to make it have uh, material qualities that could mean that if you were 15 um, centimetres away, you would still connect with that. And so it took lots and lots of development, and then we found a way to use these very varied um, river shingle and uh, hold them in the, that casting. So this is the finished project, um, and it's really a street. So the heart of it is, is an outdoor life of a street that stitches through, um, and it's... And so this is on one of the really big, the big roads there with the Tokyo... We've sort of got the Tokyo Tower just behind us. Um, and the 99-year-old lives uh, up and top left where there's uh, all the apartments from the people who were part of the site originally. Um, and interestingly, we, you saw I had that render with the cheesy blue background because we thought, you know, the bit that would matter would be where it pulled tallest. And it was so interesting to us to learn that the smallest bits have worked out in a way are bits I love most. They're scrappy, they weren't, they were kind of forced by the geometry of the site. Um, and these, these are on the right hand side, the lower but still of a scale that works well. And on the, this is where you walk up to, there's a very tiny shrine on the left. Um, and so trying to make the building come down and welcome you um, and respect the stairs that are there. Um, and uh, there's bridges that come across from higher levels, uh, which is uh, there on the east. Um, and then we also deliberately made this, the taller of these buildings at this um, eastern end of the site go down to the basement level. So when you come out from the subway, you're at that, you, it's welcoming you and pulling you up and through rather than stopping at, at ground level. Um, as you can see, everything really was about trying to find ways as best we could within the budget to, to not let it become too flat, not let it become too straight, not let it become too, uh, all that list of serious, um, and um, pulling out bits that will make shadow, pulling out bits that will hide dirt. We'd even, it was interesting, um, at a symposium that Mori, the builders of this project, gave um, before, they, I met a bacteriologist and he was talking about how, I mean, we've learned that humans, we aren't us and then our stomach's got a whole load of bacteria in it, is that us and our bacteria, we're all the same thing. And, and he also was saying how buildings, we've had a problem that buildings with this sheer flat glass, with the problem we've had is that we need more bacteria on buildings. And I was like, are you saying decoration is useful for bacteria capture? And he was like, yes. So that was really interesting. Um, so uh, the, the, the play between the different levels and then trying to use access panels, everything that we need to give to be excuses for relief, shadow, and another material, to, um, and gutters, and all the different elements. And then we've got all these different cut-throughs that go to the laneways that are, uh, are around the project. Um, and uh, you can you go through to it, but then also back to door distance. How could we make sure that you could put your bum somewhere that felt like it hadn't just been bought from the catalogue and knew it was part of the project? So sometimes you spend just as much time figuring out that as you do something that seems like it's the more important thing within the project at scale. Um, and how we can break down paving with details in that. Um, so this is this low, low level that you come out into, um, and in a way this is the sort of foundation spot of the whole project that grows out this net into the broader scheme. But 
by setting up this grid, you just get moments of different repetition. Um, and these, uh, again, because of the grid si sitting on the curve of the road, you get these moments, almost like Japanese joinery, where you get the intersections where we've let those be expressed um, and allows you to get wedged in or children. But you know, when you're a child, you want places to... what. You enjoy places. How do you make places that give joy that you'd want a child to go and... Sounds like I'm just obsessed with children getting stuck in places. I'm not. <laughs> um, but um, so, And then further up the project, you know, we're, we're trying to make invitation. How do you invite and pull people through? Um, and the, the ceiling that I think you saw in one of the renders was... Uh, it took quite a while to develop that and get that right. Um, this is a new temple. Uh, that's uh, also sitting on the site. Um, and our, our language of our pavilions is making the uh, support space. So it's quite a traditional temple, but the, our, our pavilion language melds with that and comes through. Um, and then one of the biggest headaches were with the contractors, but it was a dream to work with Japanese contractors. We've always been, every project we've worked on, people sort of go misty-eyed about Japanese contractors and the quality that they can do. And so get working out the geometry of this pleated um, fan vaulting so that it also had the ventilation and had the, um, all the different um, systems, building systems built into it. They're, they're, even those Japanese amazing contractors were uh, kind of give a kind of twitch in their face about doing this. Um, uh, and then there was also a need for a performance space. So how do you find a language for an outdoor uh, framing of performance? And so we were looking at paper um, quilling, uh, you know, when you get very fine pieces of paper. And, and so we did experiments trying to think how we could make that work. So this is this canopy. It's 18 meters high. Um, again, designing something so that it can um, uh, survive with all the... Um, uh, seismic conditions. There's also a school for a thousand children. Um, so this school um, has all its sports spaces raised up and lifted up. To its left, right next to it, that's the tallest tower in Japan. Um, and what was it was the juxtapositions in a way that I found really interesting, and that you can have children right, children right next to, uh, you know, the, uh, arguably the most serious commercial corporate building you can have. Um, and we, we were looking at how we could make a building which uh, reaches out over the landscape at the other side to that central park that we, we made. Um, and uh, the budget was t as tight as anything when we got to here, but we're still trying to find moments that could mean something. This was kind of a funny one because it was published, I, I guess, about a year ago, and I was getting messages from my mum saying, that's not very Heatherwick. I was like, Mom, what do you mean? It's like, what, we're trying, the idea is to do the right idea for the right place, not have one thing. Um, but the, the tiles that this building is made from, we found the original factory that made the tiles that the post office was made from that was on that site before. And we managed to get all their waste tiles, which, where the colours were all a bit wrong, so that we could use the, that language that actually had been in that place within the city but um, to embed that back in the project. Um, and I present to you real children walking in and out of the building. Um, and uh, yeah, finally, you know, it, we, in terms of gathering space, uh, what was astonishing is they really got behind this. Um, and they, they have cooking, cooking classes within, within some of the mounds. Um, and we got there, and it. Uh, they, so this is their, our client, Mr. Tsuji, from Mori Building. And they'd, they'd planted all these orange trees and, these, and grapefruits. And so it looked like someone, because we, you know, we knew they'd only gone in like a few weeks ago. It was like someone had got hot glue gun and had been hot glue gunning fruit onto trees. You know, what happened there? Um, thinking about living and how do you make spaces for people to live in, in a way we can... We, you try to use the projects that you get chances to do as a chance to try and push an idea or research something. And when it came to living in Singapore, we were asked to do a residential tower. And 
Singapore really has some of the most amazing presidential towers in the world where people have been really given a chance to think about um, what, where would somebody really want to live. And um, so when, when we were researching this, we were finding the problem is it's a city-state, there isn't more land, and the places that people really love to live in are these black and white houses that are sort of some of the most prized houses, but you can't build houses anymore there. But what seemed so special was the potential, the indoor-outdoor living, the, the potential for cross-ventilation, and garden, living with garden. And I've always been sort of torn because it's amazing when you go into someone's apartment and they have, you know, they can go to their bedroom, they can then go across to the kitchen, and the, the uh, logicalness of being on one level is amazing. Having lived in teeny-weeny terraced houses, you know, where you have to... You, you, I always try to economise to try and be efficient. So you end up in these things where you're coming down from downstairs, carrying the book, the glass, the leftover plate with a bit of the sandwich on it, and your socks, and you're, oh, no, I forgot the other thing. And so you're, like, going up and down stairs and things. But you have ground, and you have earth. And so you're torn. Efficiency of this versus garden and plants and that... It's kind of slightly mouldy mushroom smell that I love about living in houses in somewhere like London. And so we were taught, how could we make a building that has garden on every, every floor of a tower? Um, and then also researching and visiting all the different residential projects. They typically, they had balconies, but the balconies, the door, you could see the door never opened. And uh, they had these dry pots out there and there was this hermetically sealed indoor world. But we went to one where there was suddenly this amazing ventilation, and it was because they had windows open on both sides of the apartment, and this cross-ventilation suddenly was amazing, despite that heat. And we just thought, right, how do we get, how do we get the maximum cross-ventilation to cool, to minimise the amount of air conditioning we could use? Um, and so we were looking at that model and how, how do you get functional, useful bedrooms, um, kitchen space, all of the uh, necessary bits we need, but could we kind of break that open and allow ourselves to get the maximum amount of ventilation in? Also, could we sort of make courtyard space at height? But most of all, how could we break? The, you know, there are a lot of toothpaste-coloured boxes uh, in the world of t tall residential things, and that's... How could we get more three-dimensionality, but that focus on indoor and outdoor living? And we didn't know that there was a COVID crisis coming up. Um, so this is what we built. The project is called Eden, and it's every floor is one apartment, and it has garden 360 degrees all the way around it. And there, there's a rule in Singapore about you can get extra floor area if you make a sky garden. So you look at a lot of towers in Singapore and they'll have a hole in the tower at the top, uh, so, or middle of the tower. And we managed to ask them and persuade them that we should put that hole at the bottom. So that, because at the bottom, there were buildings around, and so anyone was just looking at the sides of uh, the buildings there. So then we could lift it up and the first apartment begins at about 20 metres in the air. So... Um, so our, our vision for the project really was these, this set of simple blades that hold up garden, and within that garden is the living spaces. So um, the, the thing was that that would then allow us to, you know, to just not have a lobby, not have a stupid artwork and sofa and all of that stuff, but just walk into a garden and in that garden are some elevators, and you take those elevators up to your apartment. Um, and so uh, then when, if we go back to door distance, it was then right, we, it needed to be concrete. That was the thing that was affordable. But how could we give love to that concrete? And so that's something we've been interested in in different projects we've been working on. And we managed to get the to topography of Singapore, and we took that and pulled it out into a skin, a model that was a three-dimensional deformation of about 26 millimetres, and then make a repeat 
that could go as wide as one of those blades. And so this is inside the mould that we were casting the blades. Uh, and that meant that we, we could get a, um, a texture. And actually, on one of these, this, you, you can see where our site is on it. So we've got a kind of lump of concrete, which is, that's where we are on this topography. Um, and even in the, what you stand on, we, we try to not let it just be flat, because people think, oh, it's stone, great, stone. But flat stone starts to look kind of like uh, wallpaper stuck on the ground. But could we carve the stone so even what your feet are touching is feeling the three-dimensional texture, a bit like when you, t you feel the um, visual impairment paving that you get in, uh, on pavements. Um, and then when you're in, when you go up to, to the apartments themselves, you're just, there's just garden and the garden and with the amazing plants that can grow in that context. And then when you've got, actually, you can open windows for 270 degrees round, it means for a few hours of the day, there is the possibility to turn off your air conditioning and just have that, the benefit of height, uh, which is that ventilation across. Um, and we managed to take that texture and also even carve the wooden doors um, using CNC machining uh, to each of these. One of the challenges in that seems particular, particularly against humanizing is just the problem of bigness. In the past, buildings just tended to be 10 metres wide, 8 metres wide, 5 metres wide. In Hong Kong, you get the chopstick towers, you know, which are just so narrow. And that kind of forced an interestingness to streets. But now, so often a property developer will say, well, it's not worth doing unless we can accumulate a bigger site. And uh, so one of the biggest challenges, I think, to all of us is just bigness. What the hell do we do about bigness? To cr because humans, we haven't got bigger. Our great 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 grandfather was still probably roughly the same size we are, and so how do you? Uh, so the eyes are the same distance apart. The, the the main kind of aspects of our humanity are the same. So this is a project in Shanghai, where we had a site, and that site was uh, typically it, it was on uh, the Suzhou Creek. So it's about two kilometers from the Bund city center. So it's not kind of the high end part of Shanghai. Typically, people will build a couple of podiums, an office tower, a residential tower. Uh, and we were sort of interested, the main art district of Shanghai M50 is just to the left. And so we were, and the site is the size of the Empire State Building lying sideways. So how do you, how do you make that, and I love the Empire State Building, but I might not like it so much sideways. Um, and so uh, how do you give someone experience at that hu human scale, at the door distance, at the street distance? Um, and we found that we needed, if we, a, a, a site this big, to get the efficiency, to get the area three and a half million square foot, we needed to have spaces for car parking, places people would sleep, people would work, people would learn, people would perform, and you end up with a grid that makes sense. And columns in many projects we've worked on, your job is to hide the column. And people are like, hide the column, like in the wall, hide the, and it seemed like the columns are like the Cinderella thing, and wondered, we needed a thousand columns. And so we wondered whether the columns, and, and typically often your role as the building designer is kind of decorating those boxes. It's like, what, what louvers should we put on it? What frit on the glass should we put on those boxes? And it felt like, could we get to something more fundamental so we didn't ca care so much about the frit or the louver or something like that? And so we thought, well, one of our, it was kind of two sites. One site we could build to 60 meters, one site we could build, build to 100 meters. So what if like a fakir's bed of nails, we hammered in our thousand columns, but tried to come down to meet the scale of the city around, so that the art district M50 to the right, we come down to that scale and come down to the, the scale on the other side, and there's also the river there. But then thinking about how we could soften, you saw all those kind of tombstones of concrete towers around. It felt the district needed a heart and could this project sort of be uh, something softer 
um, it, for that district. And so we were just thinking about how we could integrate nature. But typically, you, if you do green roofs, green roofs are heavy. And so if we stuck a green roof here on top of this, we'd have to have probably pretty deep beams, which means the whole ceiling would come down lower to transfer the load to the column, to transfer the load down. So we just thought, well, where's the best place to do put something heavy? Probably just straight on top of the column instead of in the middle that has to transfer to the column. So that's how the, this idea emerged to say, well, what, if we've got a thousand columns, can we plant a thousand Chinese mountain trees? And so this is the first half of the project. Um, and this was this picture's from a couple of years ago. Um, that's the smaller. This is the 60 meter high part of it. Um, and it, so to just try to be a, a counterpoint to the, um, all the residential uh, towers around. Um, and so, but the point was that by following this uh, geometry and coming down to meet the river that had recently been cleaned up, we could make hundreds of terrace spaces. And that meant, um, it's been weird that so many people spend so much of their life working in places. Their home has a nice place to be, but they spend more time at work. Could we have balconies so every working space has outdoor space? So uh, actually, we have us, our other studio is in Shanghai, in the Thousand Trees project, just up there, um, and um, sandwiched next to the beauty parlor and the um, K-pop uh, place, if anyone wants to go and visit. Um, and, uh, but on the city side, we were interested, how do we engage on the on the main city side, and could we treat it almost like a termite mound, slice through? And so we worked with many different artists to integrate um, and just try to break down so that we could have a, a more varied experience on a building that's 450 meters long. How do we give something to keep a level of engagement? And I think that, in, and so often our experience is that this is the scale, that this is our biggest problem altogether, is big stuff. How do you find the human scale within the big stuff? And when you haven't necessarily got all the money that you'd want to, uh, and it isn't Louis Vuitton land, um, and those are the most interesting moments. And, um, and we've been working with artists also uh, so that, uh, on the lift so that we don't have to put such expensive finishes so that you're just moving past giant artworks internally. Uh, and by that premise, we end up something that, that lights really well. Um, but I managed to get these pictures were taken this morning in China, in, um, in Shanghai, and to, just because I wanted to show you, because the second mountain is now, um, it topped out. Um, and so that's the 100 meter one. Um, and so it's starting to now really kind of blend down and engage properly uh, as, as this moves into the art district and all the old uh, plastic factories and um, uh, uh, flour mill buildings that are there that with the different um, creative people who work in those. Um, when it comes to learning, this uh, we, back in Singapore, we were asked to make a, a project called the Learning Hub, which is for fl flipped learning. So learning where you don't, uh, with the logic that why is your teacher teaching you when they can have emailed you everything a month earlier, and that they said to us, they didn't want the master and servant relationship between the kind of wise guru at the front of a class uh, and slaves bowing before them. They wanted, they said to us, no corners. But the thing that was interesting also for us was, why go to university if you can just stay at home? And talking with the professors, they said, well, it's to meet people. You should be meeting your future business partner, the person that you set up a not-for-profit with, or uh, come up with a patent together. Um, and it seemed the existing environment with miles and miles of these dead corridors and polystyrene ceiling tiles and no natural daylight was like the worst possible place for that. Uh, so we just thought, what can we, how can we make the most meeting -iest, each other -iest place we could possibly do that? So we set ourselves the goal to have no, um, no corridors um, and to, we obeyed, so we, did, we obeyed and did cornerless classrooms and taking 12 of those, you could uh, wrap them round um, and then deliberately have lots of nooks and crannies between them because so often the place you actually learn is the place you're not supposed to. 
Um, and so maximizing the, the uh, surface area of potential place to be. Um, so the building kind of isn't one building. We, and our budget was a little bit more than for a car park. So our biggest challenge was how we, the aspiration was to be the, their first green mark platinum building. The environmental codes in um, the buildability scoring in Singapore is, is really tough. They don't like on-site craftsmanship. And we had this low budget. And when you added all of that together, it meant the floors needed to be concrete, the columns needed to be concrete, the cores needed to be concrete, the cladding needed to be concrete. And when you say concrete, 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 not to you, but to someone who's walking past on the street outside, their heart doesn't leap. And so how it was like, okay, that's our challenge. How do we give love to concrete? Um, and I don't have all the slides actually here I'd want to show, but we, it became, when we were looking and finding that the price will adapt a lot if you start messing with the reinforcing bars. So we knew we couldn't use, we had to use straight reinforcing bars. And that meant we had this 26 millimetres of love we could give the surface of the concrete. Uh, and uh, so the main cores and all of those things and the columns, I don't know if I've got, I think this is to stop me talking too long as a few of the main images have been cut out. But... Um, we, we developed, our team developed one mould that could make all thousand panels on the outside from the same mould. So it was a mould where you could adjust and the radius could bend slightly differently. And it had fold, fold in pieces of um, silicon to uh, allow each one of the pieces to have a, a fascination of stopping and starting in the horizontal parts. There are windows uh, around each of those levels. But the, um, the columns uh, that are here and the main cores that you see there, we worked with an artist who did 800 ink drawings. And that was a way, by those projections of the 26 millimetres, the good thing was because what they had promised us was that they would not go for best value, they'd go for the cheapest. And cheap concrete is full of stones and bubbles and misaligned formwork and stains. And so, and everyone has sort of fetishized um, fair-faced concrete for so long and it being so smooth and perfect. We knew we had to accept utterly stained, utterly misaligned. And by creating this other layer, it, it sort of overrode those imperfections. And when you think about perfection, actually, if you go for a meal, and, and we would, the adjustment for us was thinking of concrete at, like ceramic. And with ceramic, when ceramic is perfect, a perfect plate, you suspect it might be from Ikea. But when it's full of bubbles and stones, it might be like an amazing Japanese um, sushi plate or platter. But that's full of lumps and bumps. And so we thought, why can't the concrete feel more precious by ex absorbing and accepting all of that imperfection? Um, so, uh, so Everyone faces and, and sees each other. We deliberately made all the balconies as many lingering places as we possibly could um, between, for everybody. Um, and the, uh, and like one of our team raced to, because we, had, we could only afford these kind of toilet tiles that, that would have been in a urinals, under urinals. But uh, we had this amazing team member who just went to every single tile shop in Singapore seeing if there was any job lot of anything else and managed to find this quartzite tiles that made all the paving um, and then that could flow with the same geometry and have a, a, a texture and a visual variety. And even though it's raw, it's rough, um, it's a 24-hour building. It doesn't have any doors and the climate um, it means there's, there's natural ventilation through Whenever you go, and, and sorry, on the left, you can see the, the panelling there. This artist called Sara Finelli worked with us and did these 800 ink drawings that we could put in. Um, and uh, so it's, it's become overgrown and wild just as we wanted it to. Um, in terms of thinking that how, how we come together and just for joy, what, how do we do that? In New York, we were given a project which was to rebuild a pier, um, which was uh, pier, uh, pier 54, 
which is just next to the standard ho uh, hotel uh, where the High Line is there. And the, we actually weren't given up here. We were given, we were asked to, the client had seen the project we did at the World Expo in Shanghai and thought that might make a good performance, like bandstand structure. And so there was a competition for this bandstand structure. They had a design for a bigger bit of the edge of Manhattan, on the edge of the, is it nine lane highway? And um, when we looked at it and saw the amount of money they were going to spend on this big lump that was a kind of amazing curved shape on the edge of, the, of Manhattan, and then this thing that was going to be put on it, our logic was, why don't we spend, if you're going to spend all that money, why don't we maximize the emotion you get from that money? Because the fun of being on a pier is not being on a bigger bit of the land next to the road. The fun of being on a pier is being over the water. So, and it seemed pointless to have an amazing curved shape that looked good for a bird or from a helicopter. Uh, so our argument was, well, what the, these piers, the amazing, they're amazing things. And it's very romantic, all the old wooden piles coming through. And could we uh, make the piles the hero? Could we pull away from the land and forget doing a, a bandstand structure pavilion thing, but use the money that needed to be spent anyway to do something more? And it's interesting when we come back to emotion and thinking about emotion relative to nature, there, there's many new landscape projects that have been made. And often, again, they, they, are, they have amazing plants, but you can feel that because the landscape's relatively flat, like particularly with roof gardens, you can feel that you're on a roof. And it seemed, well, what if, what if we didn't hide the piles and the piles became our hero? And instead of slapping a platform on them, they were the hero. Could we let them grow and let them lift up to make a three-dimensional uh, landscape and maybe experiment with playing with the emotion of the visitor of how your perceptions of naturalness or um, uh, created, createdness. Um, and, but equally, that could then make performance space from the geometry of that, by like lifting up the edges of a hanky, and then make it just a rectangle, not a, a shape that looks... Make it an interesting shape from the side, because that's where we all are. We're not there looking down. And so this, this project, Little Island, I don't know if any of you have been there, it, it took 10 years to do, and it got stuck in all sorts of politics, as projects do. Um, and we deliberately made gangplanks, just very simple uh, gangplanks, because what we want is your anticipation of the place you're going to go to, so not immediate gratification, which the brief was sort of, just do it right there, right? And it seemed better to have something that you see at city distance, and then hopefully is engaging um, and inviting, uh, and uh, you then, and the, the, the the portal to go through was very important. And having something that symbolized ah, leaving behind Manhattan, permission, permission to be different, to feel different. And that's about feelings. And I, I've read quite a lot of Christopher Alexander, and he talks in quite interesting ways about, the, in the pattern language, about all the different kinds of moves and related emotion. And that's something that I found very interesting and influenced something like this. Um, and so the landscape sweeps round, and we have a space where you could, if you put a performance on there, you can have 3,000 people using the, the folded landscape. Um, but then within it is also a more formal performance space for 700 people. Um, and uh, so now thinking about working, uh, we had the chance to uh, work together with BIG on a project in California where we were asked by uh, the leadership of Google to uh, create spaces as their teams were expanding. And the typical Google buildings, they were borrowing the old Sun Microsystems buildings and the buildings that the old tech firms from the 70s and 80s had grown. Um, but they had these kind of tarmac tutu all the way around with the cars on. Uh, and so the question was, how do you attract the best people in the world and how do you make the best space for them to work? And uh, in our minds, how could you improve the space all around? And you know, it, Google are known as engineers 
And it was interesting, though, when you actually analysed it, because humans haven't changed size in thousands of years, um, and actually look at what technologies are used, you end up with people need a desk, ceiling height. You end up with relatively conventional office building logics. And it felt that wasn't, that wasn't right in this setting. Um, and so we suddenly realised the site next door that they had leased is the NASA airbase, the Moffett airbase, where they had these incredible airship hangars. So it seemed, and there was just a big breakthrough moment going, you want a hangar, don't you? You actually want a hangar. And um, then we've got flexibility because you can work, we can reconfigure landscapes of work within a flexible hangar. And there was just a key moment where they were like, yeah, uh, that's what we want. <laughs> And uh, so the, the model really was of re, uh, healing up landscape that had been really damaged by toxic chemicals from the silicon chip industry over many decades, uh, building, uh, building hangar spaces. And we, so we've built um, four buildings. And we've just finished the, the fourth and final one of these main ones uh, in Mountain View. Um, and the model really was to make work team sizes, which are sort of can be optimal team sizes, can be around about 100 people, 150 people. So to make trays and layer these trays up within the space. And then we have courtyards going through. We have streets going through that connect the courtyards at the lower level. But then to give everyone perfect light working space above. So like chopsticks, we drop columns through um, and then we, uh, in effect, like a Bedouin tent, we take a semi-rigid fabric, but that fabric is, it is entirely energy generating. So instead of, so often, sustainable buildings, you know, someone's designed their building and then they sort of like post-it notes, stick some solar panels on, you know, got some solar panels on. So we just thought, what if the entire building is solar panel, a skin like a drag dragon scales? And if we pull that over, we can get large, you know, large span structures using tensile force is a very efficient way to, to, um, to pull that down and to minimize use of materials. So this was during construction. So this is the, the biggest um, in the United States use of geothermal piles to take the cool from the ground. We capture the rain in these uh, the large rain ponds to uh, capture rain to use um, and these, this is fully glazed and this was while being constructed and we worked with the silicon um, uh, with the solar panel makers to get something that didn't have that kind of blue harsh um, solar panel typical look uh, to get something that would feel special and particular to our building um, and so these are the the uh, Bayview set of three main buildings that are over near the main bay um, and uh, in the distance is the slightly larger one called Charleston East that's just finished and we had different contractors with their different strategies of how they'd be made on each of them and different languages for how we could do the the uh, the village construction inside um, and they uh, they have they have very high energy use the buildings uh, because they want very high air return. Um, but 40% of that is just from above, not including the uh, geothermal piles into the ground. Um, so, and then it really it was trying to bring, so they're almost like mountains into the town, sitting down into the street. Finally, um, I'd just talk about, um, in, from a healing point of view, a very small project, in Leeds at St. James's Hospital, uh, where we were given the last little tiny piece of green on the hospital site. It's one of the main oncology hospitals in the United Kingdom. And we were asked to make a, a Maggie Center, non-clinical uh, building. Uh, and it, we were being asked to take, and this, this uh, seems like our oh, lovely green, but this is actually the construction waste from the car park to the left with some turf bunged on it. But it's quite a big level difference across. So it was, it was kind of, we were there just thinking, oh no, we don't want the one last little bit of green. We don't want to be the ones to kill that on site. 
Um, and so we wondered, we kn knowing that, there, that green is good for healing and supports that, and there's all sorts of studies that uh, uh, clearly say that, um, we wondered, can our building uh, capture and enhance that and amplify that? Um, and then looking at whether we could make a breathable building and using, just like the, um, those dinosaur models that are slotted together, plywood, could we supersize that using the cross-laminated timber, which is basically the architectural equivalent of that. And it, it was amazing seeing how quickly it just slotted together and then using lime renders inside. And so the finished project is just three gardens. There's like three mushrooms um, where the wood is protected by the scale of the overhang. Um, and it all, those three frame a heart. And what was so powerful in the brief from Maggie's, which is quite an amazing brief worth looking at, is that it's, they are making spaces that they want to inspire you but they also, you're making spaces for people to cry in. You know, people who are dealing with some of the toughest things that you could ever go through and your family. And so how do you make this combination of, of a building that's affordable, that's an, an, an architecture that is empathic, but also that is inspiring and in, inspiring you to go through what it might take to get through it? Um, so it was trying to sort of break the scale down and some of the things talking about door distance uh, all the way through to how we use wood and, um, and just trying to put moments where something's just that little bit more than you might otherwise need to do just because it, it matters for people to feel. People can feel when you're wholehearted with something. And um, so I think in, in, in summary, really, I, I'm fascinated that littlest things are, I suppose, my hope in how we can humanise at scale and not just feel every building has to be an opera house. And it was just very telling for us when we did the um, coal drops project in King's Cross. When that launched, you know, there's obviously a, a, a more major element, which was the roof, where we had proposed that we don't just do bridges, that we could create 20,000 square foot of additional space by growing the roofs that needed rebuilding into that. But actually, and if we look at it through the lens of Instagram, when it opened, yeah, there were quite a lot of pictures of that. But there were also lots of pictures of the lift buttons. And those lift button moments where we just put it, because we couldn't afford to make the lift cause, we couldn't change the lift, we couldn't, all these things that were, weren't possibly affordable. But it's so inexpensive to think, what do you touch? And we learned this on an, another one of our projects, that the bit you touch sticks in your memory and your emotion. And it, for us, so we made one of all six cores have different lift buttons, but it's relatively inexpensive. So there's a bouquet of buttons, and you've got to figure out, well, maybe the shiny one is the one. So that's my last slide. Thank you. <laughs> wanted to pick up maybe on a couple of points that you you raised I was under the um, I was under the impression that you had mentioned that when you were putting together let's say the brief for the book humanize that the audience for it was the office originally mm -hmm. as a, a kind of kind of self-directed form of research to really I think I guess communicate maybe new objectives, new found complexities in the way that you guys have been working. And you mentioned the word boring uh, today, and it really started to trigger this relationship to an artist named John Baldessari that I have an affinity for. And I, I remember when he had his first two decades worth of painting that uh, he basically had created after he finished art school, and uh, he, he took it basically and burned them all in this kind of ritual thing, uh, in an attempt basically to somehow create what would actually be known as conceptual art. A moment where everything that one was taught about art and the practice of making 
was not necessarily fulfilling the objectives of how he felt he could uh, relate to the world. And so I'm kind of curious in, in the path and the journey, particularly of the office, when you talk about scale and making and that kind of sensibility of touch and more of the synesthetic aspects of all of that, the, the desire to kind of bring these kind of conversations to the office as a research project, if maybe you could speak a little bit to that, what motivated that as an internal project and then maybe how that actually was brought up as maybe as a, an opportunity, maybe to make some of this maybe more accessible uh, to larger audiences, because it seems to me that a lot of the conversations around a lot of the work that most of us are engaged in are really trying to construct a culture that allows that kind of complexity to emerge. It's never fully kind of understood. And I think when you actually expand and you have a community of people working within your office, you cultivate a kind of culture. But even in that cultivation, there are new kind of emerging challenges. And I, I was just curious in terms of this kind of self-directed aspect uh, that you titled Humanize, how that actually was born, I think, through the, the nature of practice. Mm -hmm. um, well, yeah, I, I was, there were a number of different influences. One, one of them was that um, I, in, in a way, I've been curious as to why so much bad stuff keeps happening and what, what's the reasons. And it really sort of hit me when in, in the studio we, we did something and we got to meet the former chief medical officer of Great Britain, someone called Dame Sally Davis. And it was because someone had, we were talking about hospitals. And some of, when you think of what am I kind of ashamed in society about is that some of the worst environments I've ever been to that embarrass me about an amazingly sophisticated, incredible country like Britain, our health environments. You think about care homes. I don't know if any of you have been to care, any care homes. Both my grandmothers were in kind of the best care home we could find, but they were terrible. And, but that bothered me most because they, uh, the, what that place, the staff who were there, if you think I'm gonna, I wanna be a nurse, and you think, oh, what should I do? Is no, oh, that's interesting. Mm. I could work in accidents, like citing accidents, and I'll help people, or newborn babies. Probably working with people where you're not going to save them, where at the end of their life is one of the least um, maybe satisfying, obvious. And yet, one thing that's certain is we will all get old. And those, those environments were not saying, thank you, thank you for looking after my grandmother. That, thank you. I know that you probably aren't paid well, but thank you. And, uh, and then hospital, you know, so many environments. And, and meeting the chief medical officer, she said, you do realize no one's in charge. And that actually she, her, she taught me something that applied to me to everything that we do, in that she said, you'll only get change in the health world if you have patient pull. I remember thinking, like, what's patient pull? And then you suddenly th realized she was saying, oh, this is my, my version of what I think she was saying, was that, that leaders frequently don't lead. They're busy, they've got so many pressures and budget, all of those things. Um, but the real change will only happen when the public say, oh, you're building a new cancer care center. Have you seen the one in Dundee? Or have you seen, uh, you, maybe, you should look at that. And so in effect, it was saying leaders don't really lead. Good, half-decent leaders listen, but only if the patient speak. And it's really powerful to me. And I remember it the first time I went into an architectural bookshop. I could hardly understand anything I picked up. And it, see, and it really hit me that as an industry, we speak to each other all the time amazingly, incredibly sophisticatedly. And I think Terry Farrell did a thing, the architect Terry Farrell did a review about 10 years ago. And part, one of the things that came up from that was that there's, the public aren't involved. The public have no engagement. And it's so powerful that 
we, we talk to ourselves all the time. We give awards to each other. We sort of say, that's award winning. But we're not really tuning in. Awards should really not be awarded unless it's really connecting, I think. Um, and so the reason for the book is to try and be help. There's no national conversation, basically. The last time there was a national conversation was about 40 years ago when our now king went, Hurrah! let's just copy the past. And I don't believe we need to copy the past. And, but because he went copy the past, the whole profession went ridiculous. And so it, it kind of never went anywhere. There's kind of, hey, how to do your fantasy living room and how to do your fantasy private home. But there isn't an, a national conversation. And people feel, people feel it. They feel a slight sense of hopelessness. They think, well, I'm not a developer. I'm not a planner. I'm not a mayor. I'm not an architect. I'm not an engineer. I'm not a builder. And they, so when we, we found that three quarters of people, so we've done some polling in the studio at, with 2,000 people across the UK, and three quarters of people say buildings affect their mental health. Um, but when you then drill deeper in, they feel there's amazing, dis they feel hopeless. So the level of engagement is, is low, even though they feel, they feel this thing. Um, and so it's interesting, we're having, I, I, I'm optimistic because there's been um, a mental health, a move to, to even talk about mental health. Like 20 years ago, no one talked about it, but now we've got footballers speaking about it and even royal people speaking about mental health. But we're not really talking about me buildings, this huge industry and mental health. And then there is, I mean, someone can't tell me that there isn't a mental health impact. And I, I've, I think that's an amazing thing to study. And as a designer, what would you do with that? Do you just follow what you think people, of course you don't, but you, it arms you maybe more. So my hope is that there could be a next stage. So the book really was, I mean, when I was at uh, university, um, in my seven years of studying, every time I got forced to write something, I hated it and I, I, it's so hard to kind of reconcile all those things, but it made breakthroughs. And the breakthrough, that was why I built my first building when I was 21, because I realized no one on building design courses ever made buildings. But this was back in uh, 1990, 91. And so that's why I built my first building. And I realized that even though my tutors all said, no, 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 make a model, make a model, they were all actually bored. And once you start, and and companies went, well, student making a building. And it sort of led, so um, we, I, th but that came from a realization from force. So in a way, yeah, writing the book was a forcer, but it's, it's deliberately written in really plain English. And it's written for, I mean, I remember I was really influenced by a book called Design for the Real World by Victor Papanek. And I remember I was about 15 and I, it was on the shelf and I read it and I just felt like, yeah, and so it felt, what is that equivalent? And so um, the book is written for a 15-year-old or a 99-year-old. Uh, and it's, um, so uh, that's, it, and, but it is also for yourself. So in a way, I now feel clearer about what hopefully the next 30 years of my studio is for. And the realization is most of all, is how uninfluential buildings are. You think like amazing building leads to more amazing things. It doesn't. And I remember when I was in 1983, I think I went to Milton Keynes and saw to an exhibition called Houses of the Future. And they built like a pyramid house and that was really ecologically amazing. And this other one, and it was, we were walking around a muddy field looking at these uh, buildings, me and my dad. And um, 20 years later, our studio got this role as a creative lead of Milton Keynes for a couple of years. And I thought, where's that pyramid house? Where's that? And so, and so we went on a hunt to find the pyramid house. And there was a pyramid house, but machine gunned in, like <laughs> terrible housing, <laughs> pyramid house. <laughs> Didn't, it, like, the world tells itself excuses, like, oh, well, they must have had more budget, or oh, well, they had a different planner, or oh, well, we all tell excuses why we don't do wholehearted things. And it made me realize that until uh, the public, and uh, sorry, 
my studio, we do about four projects a year finished. Um, and that's amazing. I'm so happy about that. And we, so in the next 25 years, if, we, if I don't get knocked over by one of my own buses, we'll, we might do 100 <laughs> projects. And 100 sounds like a lot. But it's, you know, if we stand on the roof of this building, there's 100 projects. It's nothing. That doesn't make the world around more engaging and generous and giving and joyful. I mean, selfishly, I, that's exciting to, to make places that you see joy in other people's eyes. And so it made me realize that the reason for the book is, is to try, we need more, the, the more people who are engaged in this. And it, unless you have the public asking for it, it's the planners, the clients, everyone will respond because I think a profession has so much on its shoulders, it gets cowed very easily. There's so many reasons that kind of wear people down. And, but when, if the public starts saying, come on, is that a human? I'm oh, not sure that is. We'll, that's when I think real change will happen. So the book is for the public, um, most of all. And I, but I, you know, I hope you'll all buy 50 copies. A develop, by the way, we've had a developer buy... F uh, well, we had an email from a developer saying they wanted to buy 500 copies, one for everyone in their team. I was amazed. <laughs> Okay, um, if we can, maybe we can take a couple of questions. <laughs> I've never been critiqued by Patrick before. <laughs> Patrick won't have the first question, he'll probably have the last one. <laughs> Thank you so much, just really lovely and generous and, and so honest and beautiful and it was super stimulated. And by the way, I'm joining the movement. I'm, right. I'm full on. And it was a real pleasure to see you working through these projects. And I've seen the project. Patrick, the project. here's the pen. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, I will take away certainly that, that door distance, which we don't have in our buildings, and we need it. And this, this attention to detail and, and, and really, truly inspiring, lovely projects. And, and so I'm, I'm full of ideas and stimulated. So thanks. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. And I also want to say the Google project is fantastic, and I've tried so hard to get Google. <laughs> I've done, you know, I've done these studios at the GSDF here, multiple, and I've seen meet them several times. And and congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. So envious. <laughs> That's the best compliment. Thank you. Okay, we'll still keep the two questions. Hi. Um, firstly, thank you for giving us a really wonderful glimpse into what you're thinking about. That was, as Patrick said, really, really refreshing, human, generous. Um, one thing that really stood out was the, um, the assessment of scale and its relationship to um, emotional investment and human at one level. But at the other level, the... the the planning and regulatory aspects that manage all our all our all our development, and I think, as you showed, there's a real uh, opportunity for specific design, specific buildings to make a massive impact in bringing that emotional investment into our our, our cities, our environments. I just wanted to ask about the planning level. How do you? How do you see, um, when you're talking about sort of frameworks, codification, at, w at that level, what kind of uh, things do you see as a way to bring these things into our environment or embed these things into our environment? And are there any good examples on projects you work with where you've seen that happening at a planning and regulatory or codification level? Mm -hmm. um, well, one, th one thing that uh, really hit... Um, Hit us interviewing uh, a friend of the studio who's a planner, who a planner who we made friends with who, because he'd given us a good kicking, and that kicking made our project better. And it's I I just want to break the the mindset that the public are ignorant and break the mindset because I just think it's an unhealthy starting point that the planners are the ignorant heathens who are going to ruin your project because I think we've, we've found ourselves being a really arrogant profession. And nobody wants to deal with someone whose starting point is, you, you know, you're here to ruin my masterpiece. Um, and, uh, and so 
it was really interesting that um, the w w interviewing him, well, first thing to say, the, our coal drops project, we presented our, what we thought was our great idea of how we were gonna join the buildings together and it was great. And we presented and Historic England said yes. We then went to Camden's planners and the main planning advisor has a kind of very serious looking face on him like this. And he looked and he kind of didn't love it. And, and then he was sort of there going, uh, and um, said he, did, he didn't agree with us that this movement of joining the two buildings. And then he made this comment about how um, we were not respecting the two-ness of the buildings. And of course, the typical response in any organization is this tribal loyalty. And we've worked, when you collaborate with other people, your team, they're too loyal to you. They're like, you know, did you know what the engineers have said? You know, uh, and then you know they're going, uh, the, the head of the studio. Uh, and, the, and so we came back from the meeting dejected, and you know, all the vibe was idiot planner, you know, <laughs> idiot, it was wrong, all down. And I, I'd learned from a couple of other experiences, so had to kind of, kind of calm ourselves down and say, let's play a game called, of course the planner's an idiot, but let's play a game called, <laughs> the game's called, what if, what if the planner's not an idiot? It's just a game. And, um, and because everyone's, it was like ready to go to war. And it was, once you could kind of release from that, we, we then spent a couple of weeks developing and damn it, the project got better. And we found the way, I think, that was stronger. And it was a lovely moment to go back and go, <laughs> you helped us make it better with <laughs> through kind of gritted teeth. And we became friends <laughs> and, you know, real friend of the studio. And uh, that, that planner became the advocate for the project when it came, went to committee. But the, the, what was powerful was interviewing uh, planners for the book, was finding an astonishing thing, that we, our industry is about building things. And we, we were taught by one of the planners we were speaking to. He said that um, they're never asked to come into architecture schools, not, not running major units, don't spend, said, no one invites me in. No, why, why am I not, why are we not part of it? And said, do you not realize, you know, what, what's wrong with the, this industry where we think we have a client and we have this client who's the client? And then in this industry, when there's a publication and it publishes, it publishes Heatherwick Studio wins planning for Olympia or something, or uh, Patrick loses planning. <laughs> um, they, 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 um, you know, when we get that, said, who do you think you're beating? And, and what, what he, this person taught us, we said, who do you think? He said, well, you don't realize you have two clients. You've got your customer client, who's the one paying you, and you've got the public. And so when you say you win, who did you beat? You beat the public? It's like, who here actually, arguably the, the public is your client more. And I, it was so powerful, it felt like there's a mindset reshift we need to have of these two clients. And we should be having planners in, for their sake, our sake, to really be spending time fascinated by the, the, that regulatory world. And it was so interesting, they are very hamstrung by all sorts of things. But we might get involved in some uh, helping to draw up some planning guidance, particularly for the door distance. So the working, so this campaign over the next 10 years, and we've got one of our team members here at the front is a, like an amazing campaigner, and has, so we've got a little team of three people, and anyone who'd like to get involved, um, we're, we're looking at really just how we can set up uh, encouragements to really think to, with cities, with developers, but particularly with, with, in the planning re regime of how to, to have the confidence for people to ask us to make our buildings more engaging. Who's, who, which one of us doesn't want to be asked that? Like, could you make your building more interesting? The times when people ask us that, you kind of go, oh, what? And they think, great, yeah, ask me. Yeah, absolutely, I'm happy to be pushed. Why, why wouldn't we? Um, and uh, 
so that kind of collaborativeness. But um, I think we are. If you if you if you know a lot about this, come and work with, come and help us a bit on this. But we, you know, how can we set humanising frameworks? It seems that the door distance is the one that isn't there in most planning um, requirements, and actually is where so much joy can be given at, at that's affordable. Um, and uh, so it, it's an it's an area we're we're trying to sort of go further with, but. We need amazing collaborators, and I'm, I'm sure maybe some of you might want to, in terms of studying that, do research. And I think there are ways we can get funding. We've got some really interesting um, philanthropists who are really excited by this. So I think we're trying to sort of put, find the different teams that could end up with the support that us as building designers actually really need for, for planners, for developers, for city officials, and um, builders and everyone. Thank you. Hi, thank you for your lecture. Um, I have a very quick question. I am a neuroscientist and architect, and I wanted to ask you if you ever uh, tested your projects before realizing them through uh, neurophysiological tests with subjects, and uh, if not, if you're open to do it, if you think it makes sense or if it's too extreme. Um, we would be really, really interested to do that, and I think to find the way the ways of doing that. For we we had a neuroscientist in residence who started at the studio three months before COVID hit, and so it all kind of blew apart. And then he ended up having to go off to something. But um, I think it would be really, really interesting. But I would stress there's all sorts of people who study the hell out of the insides of buildings. But there isn't this, that studying about the outside. And there's the dismissal as if it's vanity, icons, uh, just facades, all of this stuff. And I think I would, it would be amazing to have your expertise uh, thinking about outsides and taking seriously because so, when you do the maths of how many millions of people go past your projects, it's astonishing. And you think, does my project, is it kind of, my daughter has this expression, meh, meh, is it a meh? <laughs> like, is, is what you do a meh thing, or is it, a, uh, or is it, is it actually giving something to somebody over, over time? And uh, how do we not just have clumsy words like meh, but actually start to have things uh, as a provocation in the book? And actually, one of the uh, tutors here, Pablo, um, who is part of our team, who also, also tutors here, developed a tool because we're trying to think, how do you move away from the, it's ugly, no, it's beautiful, no, it's nice, no, it's not nice, with the outsides of buildings. It must be measurable in some way. And once you put the parameters of flat, plain, shiny, some of those parameters are measurable. And so uh, in the studio, we've been developing a tool which we've called the boringometer. <laughs> Um, and it, so it's just setting parameters of three-dimensionality of facade. So, and we've developed it like, uh, you know, the pin toys that you push into your face or your hand. But in effect, a gigantic, this is Pablo's solution, it's a gigantic pin toy, but it's measuring. So on a design you haven't built yet, you can measure how three-dimensional it is and then also how much repetition is there in that, and you can ascribe a score. And what's been really interesting is we've been measuring uh, many existing buildings to uh, see what score they do. And I mean, virtually every office building gets about a one. And a Sagrada Familia, you're up there at 10. And you say, where in between? And it interest, it, it's pretty good, interesting, because it doesn't care whether something's old fashioned. It doesn't care if something's curvy. It doesn't care if something's straight, but it's got parameters in there. So it's early stage, but um, someone like you getting involved to ex flesh and expand, but how do we have something so that potentially, from a planning point of view, you could have a, um, a policy that says, on these pedestrian streets, the bottom two floors of any new building should be a four or more, or give a really good reason why you're not, on the boringometer. Why not? 
be interesting to see what happened. Let's do it over dinner. Yeah. Okay. You We're have gonna... a what? <laughs> You've got a challenge. Great. I think let's do it as a dinner challenge. <laughs> okay. Um, I'd like everybody to thank Thomas. This is his first talk at the AA, and hopefully not. <laughs>